When World War II kicked off, the epitome of US tank design was medium tank M2. This is basically a self-propelled machine gun nest, which happened to have a 37mm up top to deal with anti-tank work. However, in 1939, Ordnance Branch did some experimentation to see if maybe a 75mm cannon mightn't be a little bit better at uh, the anti-infantry role. And the answer was, well, actually, yes, it is. Come 1939 also, shortly thereafter, a slight altercation kicked off in Europe. And the Americans, watching the goings-on over in places like France and Poland, uh, started to come to the conclusion that perhaps the 37mm wasn't going to cut it in the anti-tank role and you needed something a bit bigger. Well, that something bigger was the 75mm. Now, Ordnance had done the experimentation, as I said previously, you look at the T5E2, which is basically an M2 medium, that had a 75mm pack howitzer M1 mounted on the right sponson. This proved to be somewhat successful, as a result orders for the M2A1 were curtailed and the M3 medium went into production. Now this was just going to be an interim vehicle while they figured out the problems with the T6, which was what would soon become the M4 Sherman, which had a 75mm of course in a fully rotating turret. Now, Ordnance Branch were originally quite happy to simply make a turretless tank with the 75 in the hull, pretty much like you'd say a Sturmgeschutz. However, Infantry Branch still had a lot of sway in tank development at the time, and they were insistent upon maintaining the 37mm. Now, I've not actually seen any reasons as to why, just that they did, according to General Barnes. The only thing that comes to mind, perhaps, is the ability for close-in protection against infantry with canister rounds, basically big shotgun shells, which were not available for the 75. By doing all this, however, they've reduced the amount of machine guns on the vehicle, and they really did want to have this thing turn into the anti-infantry death blossom machine gun vehicle of doom. As a result, they decided to put another cupola on top of the turret with another 30 cal. This made an already tall tank even taller. Went into production in March 1941 and was known in British service as the medium tank M3 Lee. British, however, were not incredibly enthralled by either the height of the turret or the fact that the commander didn't have access to the radio. They requested that a new turret be designed, mounted on the same turret ring. It was a little bit lower, a little bit longer and deeper, and it had a bulge for the radio mount. In British service, of course, this was known as medium tank M3 Grant. Not General Grant, the British were, uh, the official documentation from Churchill was very clear not to use the word General, but in practice it turned out that people started calling it that anyway. Enter production, uh, both in the factory of the Pullman Standard Car Company, which was famous for making luxurious passenger cars for railroads, and also the Pressed Steel Car Company, famous for making slightly less luxurious rolling stock. So we are at the Museum of Australian Armour and Artillery in Cairns, Queensland. And they'd be nice enough to let us wander around their M3 Grant. It's going to go in the traditional manner. We're going to wander around the outside in part one, talk about the running gear, the engine and so on. And then in part two, we're going to hop inside and see how much fun the six or seven lads inside had. All right, so starting off with the hull, we can see, of course, this is one of the ones of riveted construction. About 300 cast hull vehicles were built by Alco and another 350 welded hull by Baldwin. But the vast majority of M3s were, of course, rivets. This was the heaviest and most time consuming form of construction. And you also had the minor hazard that rivets could pop off and become projectiles inside the tank. However, uh, it was the level of technology and so many tanks of the era were riveted as it was. The armor itself is pretty reasonable for the time. You've got about two inches up on the upper slope, one and a half down here sloped at 53, and the three-piece final drive housing is about two inches. Uh, you also, of course, have the large bulges here for the final drive. Now, the great thing about the final drive housing and transmission housing for the M3, which was kept on to the M4, was how easy it was to access the transmission. You simply unbolt the housing, pull it off, two guys could do it with a crane. Uh, if you compare that to a lot of other vehicles of the time, this was an amazing piece of uh, user interface, shall we say. It made life so much easier. As uh, other features you have on the front, there would be behind the brush guards, of course, service lights and siren plugging in here. And a point of amusement, shall we say, is the twin machine gun ports. Now, of course, remember, the Americans loved machine guns on their tanks. They really did. And 
having the cupola on top just wasn't enough. So they put the two here. These were fixed in traverse. They were aimed by moving the entire hull. Uh, they were adjustable in elevation. However, there are some immediate problems. Can you imagine being the gunner on the 75 or the 37 trying to service a target and the tank is doing this because the driver's having a whale of a time trying to spray things with machine guns? Well, this proved to be pretty much a complete waste. Uh, very quickly, one machine gun was deleted and they installed a plug uh, to fill up the hole. However, pretty soon thereafter, they decided to get rid of the second one as well as a complete waste of space. And although pretty much every M3 you see will have the ports for the machine guns, in actuality you see that they're welded over. And it's pretty rare to actually find a picture of one in service with the machine guns. They did come with tripods, they were stowed in the back of the tank and you could dismount them and use them uh, as a regular tripod mounted 30 cal if you so desired. Oddly, the machine guns were kept. Some of the earliest M4 mediums also had the twin machine guns, but very quickly they decided this is a really stupid idea and they saw the light and got rid of it. As you keep on moving around to the left, uh, obviously you have the large driver's hatch. Uh, it has a periscope inside it, of course, we'll have a look on the inside. 75 millimeter gun M2, you will note that it stops short of the tracks. This was a thing in tank design at the time. They really didn't want to have the gun go further than the track. Um, well, uh, suffice to say, uh, that turned out to be a rather silly idea. So later production vehicles had a 75 millimeter gun M3, which was longer, had a higher muzzle velocity, better for anti-tank work. You will see on some photographs of M2 equipped cannons that there is a large counterweight on the end of the muzzle. This was used for the stabilization system. The longer M3 cannon just didn't need it because the gun was heavier. You then continue around the side. Now the running gear was basically held over from the M2 medium. This was a factor in quickly ramping up production. The old fashioned vertical volute bogies two wheels per bogey, bolted simply onto the hull. Now the advantage of course with the bolts is it was very easy to make replacements. You, if you had damage to the bogey system, you just unbolt it and put a new one back in. Another advantage of this was it took up no space inside the hull, unlike uh, a lot of other suspension systems such as Christie. Uh, downsides, however, uh, you had a lack of mobility, relatively speaking, because you just sort of didn't have the range of motion for the wheels that you would have on uh, on other vehicles. Center roller on the top of the bogey. This is a, effectively they call it now a light duty bogey. The heavy duty bogies would have a return ramp for the track and also the return roller was located a little bit further to the rear. The tracks were another mobility reducer. They're only 16 inches wide. Now the thinking at the time was if you made wider tracks then the, the entire track system would be heavier uh, as well as the tank, and you had a slower tank. And they decided that speed was more important than flotation. In hindsight, this could be argued to not having been the best decision. And of course, later on, you had duckbill end connectors, or um, of course, later on, you had the horizontal volume suspension, which was much wider, had twin, uh, twin bogey wheels. The tracks are 79 links per side. These particular ones are a rather worn example of T41s. Uh, they were simple rubber pads that uh, if you're random bald on one side, you could flip them over and then run the rubber on the other side. Uh, of course, it's incredibly inconvenient. I can only imagine taking off each and every one of these end connectors uh, and flipping them over. Later, the T41 was replaced by the T51, which had a double thickness of rubber on one side, so you still had the same service life at the track, uh, but you didn't have to go through all the hassle of flipping it over. Uh, other patterns, you had rubber double eyes and you had chevrons, both steel and rubber. Primary access into the hull, of course, was through these large doors. Uh, inside each door, and you also see scattered around one of the other two parts of the hull and turret, are these pistol ports. This was again another uh, concession to the fact that you no longer had machine guns in sponsons. So the idea was you could take your Thompson 45 and just shoot out this if there was any infantry that got too close. 
The door was, of course, a bit of a liability to the armor integrity of the vehicles. As a result, by late production vehicles, they had deleted this, and the only access into the hull would have been either down through the turret basket or through the hatch, which was retained. It's on the hull roof just behind the main gun. As coming back from the door, you can see one of the unit markings. Uh, if you haven't figured it out, the British had a system of shapes and colors, which would tell you the squadron and troop that the vehicle was in. Another thing that the British usually use, the Americans you don't see so much, are the sand shields. Of course, the British were operating a lot in North Africa in the deserts. And these were simple sheets of metal uh, which covered the return run of the track and was supposed to keep the dust down. In actuality, of course, the things fell off very quickly uh, and were discarded and nobody bothered replacing them. And to come back to the back, we see again the traditional idler wheel setup of the time, just like we saw on the M10. Uh, so you would have these locking bolts here, you undo these, you will then screw in the spreader bolt. This will loosen the clamp around the idler arm. S pull off this retaining um, plate, so it's under this clip, you just hammer it off this way. You have now released the serrations, the teeth here. You then take little Joe, that big massive wrench, and lever the uh, wheel forwards or backwards to tension the track. Slap on your retaining plate under the clip release the spreader bolt, tighten the clamps, and you're done. Uh, we have the exhausts. The radiator air comes out of the hole above the rear hull. The exhausts, of course, are on each side. Behind the doors, we can see radial engine. It's angled a little bit forwards and down to allow the uh, powertrain, uh, the propeller shaft, uh, to clear underneath the hull as much as possible. Little hole up here. It's for your hand crank. It's not really used for starting the engine, but what you want to do, and this is common for any radial engine tank, is before you get going, you want to turn the engine a couple of revolutions because all the oil is probably pooled at the bottom of some of the cylinders, and you end up with hydrostatic lock. Uh, so you cycle the engine a couple of times, and then you'll be able to start it. The engine, as mentioned, it is a nine-cylinder radial, pumps out about 400 horsepower. First speed is about 24 miles per hour, sustained speed closer to 21. Has 185 gallons of 92 octane petrol, we'll get it maybe 120 miles. There are four fuel tanks, two each of 32 and a half gallons are mounted vertically at the front corners of the engine compartment, and the other two each of 60 are located a little bit more to the rear over the sponsons. You, although you can access the engine for general maintenance purposes back here, if you really want to do some heavy work or pull the pack, I'm afraid what you got to do is you got to unbolt the engine compartment deck, lift that off with a crane, and then you can lift up and out the radial. And eventually, they figured out a better way of doing it. If you look at an M18, the engine will actually slide out backwards. So that's it for the engine compartment, really. So uh, let's hop up onto the back deck. When you come up to the engine deck itself, uh, which actually wasn't all that hard because you got all the handhelds to climb on to the side door and just make a right instead of going into the vehicle. Um, bear in mind, this is an air-cooled vehicle, so it's not as if you need any ports for the cooling system. As a result, the only hatches here, there's five of them, and therefore the five fuel tanks, four for the main engine and one for the auxiliary motor. Confusingly, this is also sometimes known as Little Joe. Uh, the grill here is the air intake for the radiator, so the air gets sucked in here, blown directly over the radial engine and then out that gap uh, above the rear hull. Uh, engine air intake for the actual combustion uh, comes in through the hull, uh, through the engine the fighting compartment. We can also see back here another one of the pistol ports aiming to the rear. We can see another pistol port on the side of the turret. Again, this is all for the 45. And we have the distinctive bulge here uh, for the radio on the Grant turret. And of course, I am sitting on one of the <coughs> sponsor boxes uh, for stowage of tools and whatnot. Of course, a lot of them would also be mounted into the fixtures and fittings that are on the back of the engine deck. Well, I'm still with the outside here. We're just going to point out a couple of things towards the front of the vehicle. All right, so we now come to the hull roof. And uh, if it wasn't for the fact that there are so many people on this tank, there'd actually be a lot of room for sleeping. Uh, on the right-hand side, again, I'm directly over the 75. We've got the, the main hatch door here. 
on uh, some of the cast hold versions, the hatch should actually be sloped uh, downwards. You can see here also the mechanism for the primary sight for the 75mm gun. Of course, it's a casemate, so as the gun traverses left to right, the entire sight itself has to have room to, to swing around this pivot point as well. The 37mm gun, of course, was also stabilized, and much as you wanted the counterweight on the M2, there was also a counterweight which could be affixed here. Uh, it looks like a recoil cylinder uh, when it's mounted. It's not, it's just a lump of metal designed to balance the system for the stabilizer to take effect. Again, a lot of photographs, you'll see that it has been removed. They're just not using the stabilizer. Now, the, whether or not the stabilizer was a good thing is another matter. Um, it is frequently known that a lot of units didn't use them. They, they said it didn't work. Uh, looking into Armored Board's investigations into the matter, however, they realized that there were two or three problems. Firstly, the early stabilizers, yeah, they didn't work very well. They eventually fixed those relatively quickly. The second problem was that they were so classified that nobody taught the crews how to use them and how to maintain them. As a result, they didn't work when they tried to use them and this led to a loss of confidence. There were a couple of units that actually did do their digging and figure out how to use and maintain the stabilizers. They swore by them. Uh, they actually had better performance in the field than even Armored Board said that the, the stabilizer was capable of. Uh, but it's just another example of uh, it's not just the equipment, you got to know how to use it. So anyway, that uh, brings us to a conclusion of the exterior of the vehicle. Uh, part two will be back and uh, we hop inside and see the six positions.